Johnny, welcome to the Income Flip, my friend. Uh, thank you so much for joining. I'm excited to be unpacking a little bit uh, about your journey, uh, about Lifey, your business, and uh, welcome, welcome to the Income Flip Show, man. Thank you for having me, Rob. I'm really excited to be part of this. I'm just so impressed with the different things you're doing uh, within real estate and with the grid community. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Well, let's let's uh, let's unpack a little bit about what you're up to today, right? Well, well, actually, why don't we go back in time a little bit, right? Let's talk about um, the hustle, the work, the grind that you uh, have been on for the last 15 years. And then we'll, we'll kind of talk about maybe some of the things that you've learned on that journey and, and, and the exploration that you're going through right now. Fair enough? That sounds great. So, so how did you get into this wonderful world of real estate? How did it, how did it start? So similar to you, Rob, a little book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. It was the game changer. I had the opportunity to come across that book in my early 20s. And when I learned about this concept of making money while I sleep, it's like, I want to do that because then it opens up options to do whatever I want to do. <laughs> um, so my real estate journey really started in my early 20s. Um, and I did a study abroad program in Hong Kong on commercial uh, real estate finance and investments, turned that into an internship with Marcus and Millichap, mm. and then got my real estate license in 2009, right after graduating college. And away I went, you know, a few years didn't go full into real estate, you know, global financial crisis, mm -hmm. uh, 2009 through 2012 ish. Um, but around 2011, 2012 started working with flippers and really getting into the, the nitty gritty of real estate. Let, let me unpack that a little bit. 2009, yeah. right? So we were just off the heels of Lehman brothers filing for bankruptcy, right? The yes. world, the real estate world is completely imploding. 2009 still imploding but we're seeing things starting to kind of like you know like at least i did i started seeing like you know things getting a little bit better um but you were you you did this internship with marcus and Millichap. did you work for them right out of like once you were done or did you like tell me I, a little bit about that yeah so i ended up just doing the internship and discovering that the commercial side of real estate while the earning potential was incredible, I it wasn't an organic fit for who I was. It was more numbers, and it, there was a, a cold calling component to it. Mm -hmm. And one of my strengths is a very relational person, a very community-based person. Mm -hmm. So it was around that time I realized, if I'm going to do real estate, I much prefer to do it on the residential side, at least at this time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, um, because I think Marcus and Melichop has a very like specific structure, right, of how somebody comes in and plugs in and makes, you know, the call. I just out of curiosity, do you remember what it was? The What's... the cold call? Yeah. No, not the cold call itself, but the the uh, the activity required, the methodology that they had. Do you remember I... that or no? I do remember this call sheet of 100 calls a day. Got it. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get at, like 100 calls. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. The reason why I bring that up is because there's these companies that have been built. Aerotech was one of them in the recruiting space. Marcus Milchap, another one, where they hire really sharp young people out of school and then just get them on the phones to make, like, hundreds of phone calls. And by the way, that works. And, like... It works, but it doesn't always work for everybody, right? So you self-discovered, wait, wait a second, I'm more of a relationship guy. I probably want to play this game on the, on, the, um, on the residential side. So where did you hang your license? I'm curious. My first place I hung my license was Berkshire Hathaway. Okay. And, was, and that that around, was... was that around the time you were fixing and flipping too? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Did you did you did you um, 
focus more on the fixing and flipping side or did you focus more on the agent side? So I had initially taken a role as an operations component to a couple guys that were flipping houses throughout Los Angeles okay. and on the side started marketing myself as a real estate agent. And what ended up happening is they would go to get deals in these areas like Compton, Inglewood, South Central. They didn't have real estate agent relationships in those areas. So when they were done flipping it, I had already, already had my license. We turned it into this in-house shop where I would just list the deals anytime they didn't have a real estate agent. Mm -hmm. And we continued with that for a few years until a certain point where I was like, I could actually make more money and I think even be happier if I just did this full time, the real estate sales. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, so you, so you converted over from operations with sometimes selling, right? To yeah. full time real estate sales. Is that correct? correct. Okay. Yes. With Brookshire Hathaway? When I went full time, I moved over to Keller Williams. Got it. Okay. So tell me a little bit about that journey. Uh, in a nutshell, I loved their training and their models. I had read The Millionaire Real Estate Agent. I connected with the principles that were in that book. And instead of me getting creative for some time, I was like, I'm going to follow this recipe until another, until a later date mm -hmm. where, it, where it no longer makes sense. Um, however, that journey was really interesting because only a couple of years into building my real estate business, I ended up going into leadership within the KW system. So I really stepped away from a lot of the real estate sales in 2016 and became a team leader within their system. Okay. So tell me about what that team leader role looks like. I know what it looks like, but for our <laughs> listeners, tell me a little bit about what that looks like. Uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, whether you liked it or didn't like it, what you learned, what you didn't learn. Like, give me the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah, absolutely. It's a pretty intense role. It's based off of recruiting. So your whole goal is to build relationships with real estate agents and pitch them on the vision you have for your office with the hope that they would join your office and begin contributing to your bottom line of your office. Um, within the role at the time, we were required to hold 40 appointments um, a month. And that was pretty intensive. Uh, we, we were measured very specifically by the appointments, by our conversion rate within the appointments. And ultimately, the goal was to sign on 10 agents and at that time there was no barometer of what type of agent it could be a new agent it could be a really seasoned agent the new agents are easy because they pretty much need the same things um, but the experienced agents that's a much longer life cycle as you go to begin recruiting somebody within that how did how did how did you like that role i loved it um I overall I loved it for I was very young I was in my 20s I was the only team leader in Los Angeles that was in my 20s doing that role and it was a time where I was uh, really competitive mm -hmm. and the first office I had the opportunity to do it for it was very small I only had a couple staff members and I was positioned right between KW in Santa Monica KW Beverly Hills KW Brentwood all these big brand ones, and I had taken over this turnaround oppor opportunity with the whole goal to make it profitable. So it was this really fun project without a lot of pressure. I was almost expected to fail at it. <laughs> and within a couple of months, when I started hitting my numbers, you know, I hit my 10 recruits, started creating some curiosity, like what's going on over at that one? And I really played into that with all of our agents that were the underdog. Mm. And, and the people in this area look at our brokerage and, and they don't have respect for it. Like, how do you guys feel about that? Is that what you guys want it to be? And really left it up to them and they stepped up to the challenge 
And it was really ultimately the agents that made it all happen. And I did that opportunity for two and a half years. And then I moved to a different KW, a couple miles down the road in Santa Monica, that had all the resources. And it was there that I made a name for myself at that at that brokerage. How did how did you make a name for yourself there? So at the time there was different recruiting records within the company and again me being super competitive the OP had challenged me and one other team leader. He basically was running a two team leader model and he's like nobody has recruited 30 individual agents in a single month. Sure people have acquired brokerages People have brought on teams of 20 and then recruited 10 people in the same month. But I'm challenging you both that you can't recruit 30 agents in a month. And this was only our second month working together. Hmm. And we did hit that goal. And what, when we hit the goal, what happened was all the systems of the office broke. So because we went into such an aggressive growth phase, we realized we didn't have the agent services, the onboarding, the systematization, systemization of that whole process in place to support that sort of agent intake. So then I tapped back into my operations in talking with the ownership of the brokerage. And I ended up going on a six month journey to like fix all their systems while mm -hmm. still recruiting. Um, but that's where I got some of the best business education that I've gotten because I had a pretty long leash and a lot of trust in me because I had already built those systems at the previous brokerage, mm -hmm. uh, the turnaround opportunity. Uh, so that's really where, where I was like in my flow state. Yeah. In interesting. What year was that? That was up until 2020. Okay. Um, so it was 2019 and 2020. I was at KW Santa Monica. Got it. So, um, kind of crazy, right? COVID was in 2020. So were you, were you like right before it? Did you leave right before COVID? Did you leave at COVID? Right. So I had separately la launched a young professionals chapter in Los Angeles, um, through the Keller Williams system. And that was highly successful. We grew to be the largest chapter in California very quickly. And because of that, and my track record of recruiting and now building systems, there was an opportunity that opened up for me at KWRI to run an entire division of the young professionals. Mm -hmm. And I ended up saying yes to that job in February of 2020 and moved there on March 9th, 2020. Oh, and it was our third day in the office and Gary Keller called us into a room and said, hey, there's a pandemic going on, we're gonna go home. Might be a couple weeks, might be till June, uh, but we're gonna go home for a little while. And we all went to work from home in this opportunity I had just taken to travel around the country launching these different young professional chapters. This entire plan I had created, I had a nine page game plan of if I got this job, this is exactly what we're gonna do. And on the third day that all went out the window. <laughs> It's like the Mike Tyson, right? Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Absolutely, Rob. That is one of my favorite quotes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, let, let me go back real fast. Yeah. Because you, 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 you essentially earned your right into this bigger market center that's got all these resources. And you, you hit a goal and you realize there's all these things that are broken. Um, what did you learn about that process, right? Like when, when you guys dumped fuel into, you know, that fire and then it just, it, it caused a lot of bottlenecks to happen. What did you, as a business person, what were your, some of your key takeaways? Right. So because of the growth, it highlighted all the areas that we needed to focus on. And if I would have just spent all my time building the systems when I originally got to that brokerage we wouldn't have even known where they were broken. I might have been fixing areas of the business that didn't need fixing. By focusing on the growth initially, it revealed all the different places where the, the business needed attention. 
So I think about whether you're a real estate agent and you're like, wait, I need my business cards. I need my website and I need this. And Well, if you go out and just start doing it, you actually just be the real estate agent and start doing the deals. Mm -hmm. All of the gaps will start to surface, especially in a time of forced growth or competitive growth. Interesting. What about uh, all along this process? It sounds like you, you had been also keeping your investor hat on. Is that correct? Absolutely. So the first investment opportunity I got into was 2013. Mm -hmm. It was a three bedroom condo in Los Angeles. It was a thousand square feet, tiny, tiny rooms. I rented out the two bigger rooms and took the, the smallest room. This was before I even knew what house hacking was, Rob. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just doing it because it seemed like it made sense. They were paying for my mortgage. Mm -hmm. And with that sort of a, a plan in place, um, I was able to really focus on all my real estate stuff. Uh, and I had that condo until 2015. And the only reason I sold it was there was a better real estate deal that came my way. It was an opportunity to get in on an eight unit complex in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, mm -hmm. There was somebody I had met in college. We had always talked about doing a deal together. He's the one that introduced me to Rich Dad, Poor Dad. We bought that for $400,000. Uh, the, the rents were pretty, pretty low at the time. And anytime somebody had moved out, we would renovate that unit and start churning higher cash flow, attracting a higher quality of tenant. And fast forward less than 10 years later, because that was 2015 when we bought it. And I mean, it's easily worth like 1.2, 1.3 million. We still have it. We collect from that isn't that nice right isn't that isn't that such a isn't that such a nice thing when you like i did something one time and then i got paid forever and my net worth went up and you go why didn't i buy 10 or why didn't i buy 20 right like yeah. at least that's at least at least sometimes yeah. I, I reflect on that myself right but that's fantastic and so so you've kept that investor hat on this whole time. Did you ever buy into the market center? Did you get any ownership in any of the market centers? So I technically earned ownership in my first market center. And I mean, I'm technically a 1% owner of it till this day. Um, it's not something I'm pursuing. It, it, uh, I, the entire KW model, I'm, less attracted to at this stage of my life. Um, and yet, yeah, I, I was able to earn in, which is, which is great. Yeah. It's, yeah. you know, uh, like all seasons there are, you know, the brokerage season has been very difficult for, for not just KW, but for lots of brokerages around there. Um, it's hard to make a profit in those businesses, right? So it's hard to make a profit in those businesses. I mean, if they're running really well, you're making a three or 5% margin <laughs> and that's if they're running well, right? Um, and so, so let's fast forward then, right? Yeah. Cause we'll, we'll, we'll delve into that a little bit. You are uh, about to launch this young professionals group, this Keller Williams young professional group around the country. You've got this playbook, you get punched in the face, the plan changes, like, what do you do? What did you do? I did a lot of listening and observing. I really needed to see like what the impact would be. The, at the time, um, people would, that were a part of KW Young Professionals, when I would go and ask them what they thought the value proposition was, it was the in-person events. Hmm. And when I took over Keller Williams Young Professionals, there was already a thousand members. So I did have fear around cancellation because our number one value proposition, which is really community, right? These like in-person mm -hmm. events with community was being stripped away. And the question became, how do I create community without the in-person events? and very quickly brought the entire division online. Mm -hmm. And during COVID, 
the first weeks, I had office hours every single day. It's like 5 p.m., post-work, come by, come by, come hang out. We had people that met that ended up getting married, having kids together. Like, so community was created online. And it was a experiment. It was a lot of leaning into the gut and really listening to them of like, how do we, how do, we do this? How do we move mm-hmm. forward in this new, this new world that we're in? Well, well, how did you move forward, and what did what did it look like? And I, I, you know, I assume you don't, you're not, you're no longer doing that today. But Correct. how did you lead through a a global pandemic, and did you grow it, or did it, or did it shrink? No, we grew it, which was kind of crazy. Um, so, again, it was like leaning into the different people in the division. I needed to figure out who are the players in this division. If there's a thousand people, realistically, how many of these people can I pour into? And in the model that I inherited, there was already 30 chapters. And it was going to be hard for me to have a high level relationship with 30 chapters. So I completely disrupted the model and started treating it as a regional, as a regional thing, five different regions. Mm. And within the regions, different presidents under the regional direction, under the regional directors. And in that sort of a model, we were able to grow um, because it was like the game of telephone, but with people that I really trusted and had worked alongside uh, to really create what it needed to be. And there was a trickle down effect and we were able to grow it up to 1250 um, in my year and a half within that role. And I'll say more so than anything, the, the thing I'm the most proud of is going into the summer, it was late spring of 2020, there were riots that broke out for racial injustice. And I called one of our KWYP members that had a heart for this, um, I called her at 10 p.m. on a Friday night. It was the same night that there was fires and riots in Atlanta, and I had been watching TV and was just beside myself. And we created this division-wide open conversation that was going to be on the topic of racism and how to move forward and how to communicate, how to do community together. If that's our number one value proposition is community, like how are we going to do community given this time that we're in? And by us doing that within the company, so that all happened Friday night, we agreed to do it Tuesday. We hosted that open conversation on Tuesday. KWRI and KW as a whole would not touch that topic. There was one email sent out on that topic. They wouldn't touch that topic for another month. Hmm. It was a highly controversial topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at the time I felt like we had nothing to lose and we were the next generation of leaders. So instead of talking about being the next generation of leaders, let's just be the next generation <laughs> of leaders and start having the conversations we need to be having. And then it was funny because then MAPS, which is the coaching division, the coaching lever of Keller Williams, they came to me and were like, how do we host a conversation like this? Mm-hmm. KWRI came to me, Human Resources, how do we host a conversation like this? Our division became the leaders of the entire organization. And that story goes untold because it, we outshined with very little resources, a company that has you know 200,000 agents, all that stuff. Uh, so that was the thing I was the most proud of in my- That's awesome, man. My time that's, there. That's so cool, that's so cool. Well, let's talk, let's talk, yeah. a, let's pivot and let's talk a little bit about Lifey. Right? Yeah. Like, what is Lifey? How did Lifey come about? You're the founder of Lifey. Yes. So it actually came about on the third day on the job when all my goals went out the window. Mm. And I realized this whole year long goal in this sort of an environment is just too long. I don't know what's going to be happening six months from now. Is Are things going to open back up with COVID? Or are they going to stay shut down? Like all of us were in the state of not knowing. And I had read a book at the time, the 12 week year, and it helped me understand that you could do life in these short sprints. 
Hmm. So I created a planner that was for your whole life. That was figuring out where did you want to focus that quarter, choosing a word for that quarter. What was the theme of that quarter? What one thing could you accomplish that quarter that'll help you become the person that you want to be? And sometimes that's business. Sometimes it's life. It's something with your body. It's something with your diet. It's something relational, emotional, mental. And it was really hard for me to put any of these in a single box of like what it is. So that's how it got its name of Lifey. Mm -hmm. of it's all these different areas of life and what area of life are you looking to focus on this quarter? Mm -hmm. And then ideally you share that with other people and you find other people who are on that same journey of doing those same things you're doing with your life. And you guys could mastermind together, crowdsource information. And then every quarter, it might change. You might choose to focus on a different area of your life. So that's how it all came about. And it started in the form of a, of a planner. And then it became this online community because we were still during the pandemic. And then when things started to open up, we did some retreats, some goal setting retreats. And the brand continues to evolve if I'm being a thousand percent honest with you right now, Rob, I'm not a thousand percent sure where the brand is going to go. It's a passion project. Um, it is something that I believe in because by the end of the day, once we have the investments or we get into a place where we have some more time in our life, I think it's the most fulfilling thing in the world to be able to, to help other people. Well, let's, 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 let's deep dive on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, Here's the thing. I, I didn't ask you when you left. Um, I guess you left uh, the position um, of running KYP, right? Yeah. Keller Williams Young Professionals. Yep. Um, did you just focus all your time on lifey, or did you like, or did you decide to take a sabbatical, or did you, you know, how are you making money? Like all yeah, that stuff. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. So yeah. there was some contractual upon my departure that made it uh, very challenging to, to do anything within real estate my first year in leaving KW. Um, in full transparency, I was still coaching, and that is something that has remained intact, is coaching and consulting specifically with real estate agents to help them build their brand and help them build their business. Um, and so, yeah, I needed to do something to, to pay the bills. I also, I had gotten involved with some commercial investing at some point, and that had gone through some 1031 exchanges, and we ended up selling all of that right before the pandemic, thank God. And in the last few years, I've, d I've gotten into some franchise investing that pays mm -hmm. really high returns, and I don't need to think about anything. It's a fund that handles the acquisitions. They pitch the vision of what, what it's going to be. They share with you how long the play is, whether it's like a lifelong play or just a like a five-year play. And so that's something I've been doing to help support myself during this brand building of Lifey, which is more of a passion project right now that will turn into something much more. Oh, it, will. it, it absolutely will. Yeah. Okay, let me let, let me let me unpack this. Yes, uh, this, th this sounds like a syndication franchise. Like what? Like, like how be like what? Yeah. What is that? Like, yeah, so it started uh, 2015, 16 had a friend. It was I went to high school with him. And at the time he was at Marcus and Millichap. Mm -hmm. and doing the sales side of things. And he had come across an AutoZone deal that was in D. Iberville, Mississippi, somewhere we had never been. We were born and raised Los Angeles type thing. We ended up investing in this, extending the lease and send, selling it one year later for almost double what we had initially invested. Mm -hmm. 1031 that into a strip center and then ultimately liquidated that strip center when we felt that the big box strip center could be in for some struggles in the in the future. And once we had done that, he had gone full time into creating a, a fund to do franchises. He started with Little Caesars. He acquired 20 mm. Little Caesars. It was in Michigan. It was around the time in Flint, Michigan, where everything had happened 
with the contaminated water. So these were really cheap opportunities to get into this whole franchising world. And from there, he realized, wow, with this, you could own the real estate and own the business and you can create value by running a better business or by being strategic with the real estate or just holding it over a long period of time. Um, so I've now done three investments with him. Uh, it's got to be the right investment for me. It's got to meet my criteria. Um, so a couple that are high cash flowing opportunities and one that's more of like a home run that we're looking to hit. Got it. Okay, so I get so he started a fund. I get it now. Yeah. That that um, that buys franchises that have physical uh, real estate attached to them, right? Because there's a couple different plays that you can have there, and uh, and you've been investing into the fund and just getting a rate of return on that. That fantastic. I love it. I love it. Stay connected to him. Like that. That's that sounds like a a cool thing. He, he's a lifer that he's changed my life in a couple of different ways. Um, he suggested he, he had stopped drinking alcohol about four years ago. And he's like, hey, have you ever stopped like considered that? And I was like, no, he's like, oh, you got to do it. And you'll get a totally clear mind and all this. I've now been over three and a half years without having a drop of alcohol. About a year ago, he called me and said, do you cold plunge? I was like, no, I don't cold plunge. He's like, go buy one. So without any questions asked, I bought a cold plunge, and now it's something I do. I'd like to say I do it every day. I don't actually do it every day. It's maybe five times a week, but it's been amazing. Yeah, I think I think I gave up alcohol about five years ago, and um, and I, I I am now rubbing off on my my one of my closest friends, one of my dearest friends. He's like, yeah, I've gone I've gone a week without alcohol. I'm like, cool. Like, how do you feel? He's like, I feel fantastic. Like, I feel so much better. Like, I'm not tired i'm like exactly like alcohol yeah. sucks the energy out of you it's just it's a freaking poison you're putting in your body like when you actually say it's poison it's poison right it, i just stopped putting alcohol in my body feels so much better rob i think that is such a huge point especially that we're in the real estate industry and so much of it has a social component to it and a lot of my drinking was these like client events, networking events. Sometimes it was because I was nervous. I would show up to a networking event and I didn't know anybody. And I was like, let me have a drink and like take the edge off. And you get to a point once you start stop drinking and you show up to these events where you actually feel powerful. And, and someone might comment like, oh, you're not drinking? And you're like, no. And they almost start to feel nervous and they're like, I'm just having one, I'm driving. And I'm like, you're good, you're good, right? But it is this very powerful choice to make in your life. Yeah, yeah, it's a choice, it's a decision, yeah. right, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so so Lifey, getting back to Lifey, it is a community, it started off, right, uh, like you're not quite sure where you're gonna take this brand, uh, but it started off with this Lifey journal, essentially. Yeah. Right? And as you were kind of explaining it, like what came to mind was it sounds like you're picking one area of your life to obsess over. Maybe obsession is the wrong word, but you know you're picking one thing to really think about um, for that particular quarter. Quarter. It's not like, or is it one thing in health and one thing in wealth or one thing in business? Like, like yeah. what is it? Is so it that more? it it leaves that up to the user. It does recommend anywhere from one to three. Like, do not mm -hmm. go past three. It becomes uh, overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Um, yeah. I do, the language I use around this is an anchor goal. Mm. So there's that anchor goal where it's like, if none of, if, if these three, if you had to choose one, which one would get the most focus? And that's happening. Like, once you've made that decision, it's not an option. Now you're putting it in your weekly plan, your daily plan. And that's hap you get to be present now in life because mm -hmm. you made a choice. And then three months later, you have an opportunity to reevaluate and mm -hmm. figure out like, what now? What do I want to do now? But I find that as humans, and I have ADHD, that I can get excited about something and a couple weeks later, stop it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is my way of, no, 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 I'm giving this a full quarter. And then that little shift, the first time I ever tried this was with the drinking. I was like, I'm gonna try mm -hmm. not drinking. And now that shift has led to all these other domino effect in my life. 
Yeah, that that's that's awesome. You know, as I've trained agents and trained sales teams, um, one of the biggest areas, well, one of the biggest opportunity areas is to get people to focus on like one thing, right? Like for an extended period of time, one of the reasons why most agents fail or teams fail is because they've just got a scattered brain. It's like all over the place. And so when your energy is scattered, nothing actually gets accomplished. So this sounds like it really helps focus the person on the thing that matters, right? Um, which, you know, that goes for life, that goes for building wealth, that goes for building a business, like everything. And you and you realize that that power of focus is actually what makes all the difference, mm. right? Yeah, power of focus is what makes all the difference. I love that, Rob. So, so this community, where do you think you want to take? Obviously, we, we run a community, right? Uh, yeah. We've... Grid started as a passion project. Uh, I ran it for years just as a, like my own independent. It wasn't called Grid. It was just my investment network. I called it the Kaz Investor Network, and it was just mine, right? And it, it served me super well. And then it became more. I found some people that were like, this is really cool. Like, you need to share this with the world. Like, let's share it. And I was like, okay, well, you know, and we, and we started sharing it as a passion project and it's evolved and we now have a very clear direction we want to take it in. But I'm curious where you think you might want to take Lifey. What could it look like? It could look like a number of different hubs eventually. Mm -hmm. um, because it started online, the people were from all different parts of the country. And when things opened back up, I think the challenge that I've faced is okay, I think we need to go back to local. Like, I, I think I need to create it here where I live in Chattanooga, a community of goal setters. Mm -hmm. And from there, then maybe we could vamp back up and go to different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. But I went so wide because we were in the pandemic and I see myself going very narrow and thin with it. Um, one thing that we have been doing this last year is highlighting different people who subscribe to this sort of thinking, this goal setting thinking, this focusing on one thing thinking, and we've been highlighting them and calling them featured lifers and doing this publication piece around it. We have a digital magazine called the Lifey Pulse. Mm -hmm. And every month where we feature a new person, I end up learning so, so much and having all this awareness come to me of different places it could end up. I think the first most organic step will be for it to land in the yoga community somewhere. And that's mm -hmm. just because I am on a personal journey right now. I'm doing my 200 hour yoga teacher training. Uh, it's, it's a very organic place to start. A very, very organic place to start. Jenny, how did you, how did you land on the yoga piece? Just curious. How did that come about? How did yoga become part of your life? My first introduction to it, I knew there was something there. I was 16 years old and knew there was something there. Really got the call about a year ago to, to give it a real shot. Not just the like once a week, mm -hmm. a couple times a month. No, what would your life look like if you actually did this consistently? And it was through that curiosity I had in the process that I ended up going all in and ended up signing up for 200 hour yoga teacher training more so for the accountability of mm -hmm. actually do it. One of the requirements of the program I'm doing is that you take yoga five times a week or that you practice yoga five times a week. So I've really dove in and the whole goal behind all this Rob is freedom. Mm. You know, we talk about investments and what was the goal there? Financial freedom. Mm -hmm. This is freedom from physical pain. Mm. This is being able to manipulate the breath in a way where I could calm my own nervous system and make mm -hmm. better choices, be more present. So it's the one thing that I could focus on right now that will trickle into every other aspect of my life that when I go to find my next investment, I'll do it with a very clear head. I'll do it understanding it fully, I'll move very slowly before I say yes. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. because of the yoga. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, I think I shared with you, right? It's it's one of the things that I. Uh, well, I'll tell. I'll, I'll I'll I I think I might have talked about this at some point. I know I did a a social piece on it, but um, I started at some point, maybe five or six years ago, developed this weird, like, anxiety that would manifest in my hands, meaning my hands would sweat. Like, I never, like, I've always, I, I, I've been self-employed business owner since I was the age of 24, right? Like, I, and I never manifested stress in that way where I was like, man, why am I sweating? Like, why are my hands sweating? Like, why are my armpits sweating? This is, this is weird. And I, you know, didn't feel anxious, but, but obviously I was right. And, uh, I was like, something's going on with my, my fight or flight. Like my, like I am, I'm somehow getting triggered, right? I'd answer my phone. Like as soon as I would touch my phone, like my, my hands would sweat. And I was like, that's, bizarre right like and nothing nothing was more stressful than it how it had always had been if that makes sense like there wasn't like any new element uh, the only new element was i was getting older right like i was like just just older and i was like you know i think i need to i think i need to go do yoga i don't know why i was like i think i need to go do that and i started practicing and i realized that maybe like after a couple weeks like that went away, completely went away. I would leave, you know, a session and feel like I was on high, like the level of high that I would have was just like nothing I'd ever experienced. And I wrestled division one in college. Like I, like I'm an athlete, but I had never experienced something to do with the rhythm breathing, the deep work, the physical exertion, the sweat. Like I was like, I've never, it's hard for me to explain to people unless they kind of go through it, right? And uh, and it went away, right? And I was like, oh my God, this thing is so healing and it just feels so good for my body. I feel like I give myself a gift every single time. And so like, I, I just want to applaud you for deep diving on, on, on getting your certification. I think that's freaking awesome. And uh, and by the way, for those that are are, are listening in, you start you start researching some of these really high level CEOs and you realize that they practice a lot of, a lot of meditation, right? And I think yoga is a form of meditation at its core. That's what it is. Um, rhythmic breathing, physical exertion meditation, right? And it's, it's amazing. So I'm going to just recommend it to anybody to go try it. If you're maybe feeling anxious or have any kind of anxiety. Absolutely. Rob, I, started a meditation practice almost five years ago. So when we were talking about those record setting months of recruiting agents at KW, I was meditating during that time and literally going down to my car for 20 minutes during the middle of the workday and mm -hmm. meditating. Mm -hmm. And the form I had originally learned was transcendental meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it's a popular one amongst some of the, some of the folk that you mentioned. Um, but I fully agree. There's a meditative component to yoga, a physical component to yoga, a breathwork component. There's all these other these these different facets of of yoga. They're all rooted somewhere in freedom. Yeah, you know it's interesting. Like freedom, the, and I'm glad that you brought that word back up because when I think about everything that we do, is that we take people on a freedom journey. And the longer that I'm in this, I've, I've reflected that it's not just freedom of, uh, you know, of find like, it's not just financial freedom, right? It's like, it is a health freedom. It is a stress freedom. It is a mindset freedom. Like it is this, it's this spiritual journey really that we go through as entrepreneurs. We developed the seven levels of, of wealth framework. And what I realized was that that, that seven levels of wealth freedom uh, 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 of uh, uh, freedom framework was was really just a way to to grow, and that ultimately that the very top part of that is creating impact, which you could call impact. You know, it's almost like a you know uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs at the very top, right? Like, um, like you're like, oh, I, 
I'm just kind of unlocking myself as an entrepreneur when I go through this. Right. That is so powerful. I got chills when you said Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's exactly what was present for me. I was imagining this person that comes across grid and they're like, what's grid? They join grid. For those of you not familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs at the very bottom, it's the basics. It's food, it's shelter, it's water. So when Rob's talking about investments or passive income from the investments, it's really making that first step to move in a direction where you can transcend that level. And ultimately the, the end goal is the self actualization. Mm -hmm. And as you go on that journey, the, the wealth is a part of that journey. Like you need to take care of that first. And because you take care of that, it allows you to step into yoga. And you know, this last weekend I did 20 plus hours of yoga teacher training. I wouldn't be able to spend 20 hours of having fun at yoga without making that original commitment 15 years ago to start investing in real estate. 100%. Like I, I tell everybody, this is, this is more of a journey of self. It's not like money or anything else. Right? It, it is literally the, the entrepreneur journey is a journey of self-discovery because as you become successful materially, right, there's these, there's these things that happen, right? Like if you're not careful, like your life can become shambles, right? You, you think of the number of entrepreneurs who have ended up in divorces and, uh, you know, they, they do the wrong thing and they end up in jail. Like they, like there's all these pitfalls that can happen as a, as an entrepreneur, unless you go inside and inward and discover that this is really a journey of, of self growth and that everything outside you is just, you know, it's almost not real. Does that make sense? It's, it's almost yeah. like not real. Yeah. It's like the only it's, thing that actually matters is that internal part and the external is just the validation. It, it comes from having that clear internal. 100%. 100%. And it's hard for people to understand that unless they've actually gone out and, and done some shit, right? And like like woken up one day and you're like, hey, there's got to be more to this, right? Like I, I just can't, you know, it's not about selling another house or working with another buyer or flipping another house or making more money, right? Like there is more to this. And like let me now go on that journey, that discovery of self, and and the what impact do I want to make in the world? Like while I'm here, I've only got, you know, a hundred years or 110 years, 120, however long you want to live, right? And can I be the best expression of myself, you know, uh, on this journey? Can I be? I would always say, can I be a positive light on this journey versus, you know, a negative dark light? Um, and so. Yeah, man. Sorry, we're getting a little philosophical right now, but I, I think I think I think it is valuable for people to listen to this conversation because sometimes, you know, you get caught up in the in like this hustle culture, like do more, get more, and like there's no there's always going to be a bigger fish. I was telling these kids right before I jumped on this podcast, right? I was like, there's they were like, how do you, you know, how do you stay motivated if like you're like you're already successful and I'm like dude guys there's always a bigger fish there's always another mountain there's always these other things but the the truth is can you can you feel good about who you are and what you're doing and what you're building and the journey you're on and if you got that you're already wealthy right a hundred percent I imagine Rob you're holding a fish and you have gratitude for the fish that you're holding and you're excited about the bigger fish and it's that's happening at the exact same time at the exact same time 100 percent. and then like that 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 at least for me makes me happy brings me joy gives me energy because people are like well how do you you know like how do you maintain your energy i'm like well i i i have gratitude for what i have i have an idea and a vision an ideal of where i'm going and i'm just having fun on that journey like just like you're having fun with your 200 hours right now Right, you're learning, which is probably something that's stimulating you. You're meeting new people, 
which is building community, so it's filling that bucket. You're doing work on your body and your breath, which is making you feel fantastic, right? It's like, dick. How there? You cannot lose. You can only win, right? It's it's so cool. It's exactly how I feel. So cool. Well, I'm excited to check back in at some point in the next, you know, year, two years, three years. See how lifey evolves, right? Because there are these things that we have in, in our life that we know that they're seeds of something and that we just need to continue to pursue those seeds of something to see where, where they end up taking us. At the core, life is community, right? Yeah. People, we, we want community. And your community will be filled with people that um, believe in what you believe and vice versa. Like our attract, like, and so you will attract your tribe. You will attract your community. Like you have to understand what you stand for, right? We know that we're taking people on that self-actualization journey, by the way, yeah. Johnny, uh, but through real estate. Like, right. Like, like that, that's how I think of it. And so I think any community that really self-reflects on like what are they doing, like they are taking people on these journeys and they're just expressing it a certain way. Hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. So you just got to kind of define like what, what, how do you want to, how do you want to take people on that journey? And like, how do you want to, you know, how do you want to take them? Like, what are, what are the things that you want to do to take people on the journey? Hmm. Because the journey is the same. Like the journey that I take people through with grid will be the same people, same. It's, it's the same journey. Right. For life, for life. It's just, it's just looked at slightly differently. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I've got clarity on that end piece. Like the self-actualization would be, it would mean everything for me for them to go on that journey. The modality in which it happens is exactly where I need to get that clarity. I appreciate you highlighting that. Like I honestly, like I, I would look forward to our next conversation, whenever that is, and we could look back on this moment. Cool. Yeah. Have you ever thought, have you ever thought, because you're on this journey right now, yep. with the, like yoga, just out of curiosity, uh, you're like, well, maybe there's a yoga school in my future somewhere, right? Is that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, I've already got the branding. I've got it. <laughs> yeah. There, there's like, something there. And even that is, I'm, I'm applying what I learned in real estate, which is, KW, dependent on physical models, then you got the EXPs, the reels, you could do it virtually. Like, do I even need a physical yoga school or yoga studio? I'm not sure there's already so many physical structures around the country. Is there a way to build something and put it inside of things that already exist? Because I don't want to just create something just to create another thing. I want it mm. to help make, if we put one into a city, it makes that city better in some way. So I would love to, th this is the the journey and I'm still figuring it out, like still figuring out how to get yeah. there. So, 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 I, and this is more curiosity. Yeah. Like, so you mean you could take this idea of your yoga studio, because I think there's a good business thing for people to think about and be like, okay, can I put this into a co-working space somewhere? Because the co-working space, there's already community that's there, and now we can layer yoga classes at all of these, you know, well, spaces, yeah. like spaces is one of those high-end, kind of like a WeWorks, yep. right? Um, so that's an interesting, that's an interesting, like you're not creating more, you're creating a, an event, right? You have your own brand, an event on a on a, within a community that already exists. Like, yep. Uh, uh, how you see this manifest, by the way, um, is have you ever had Brothers Pizza? Do you know what Brothers Pizza is? I have not. Okay. So if you go and you Google it, it's like Brothers Pizza is actually pretty damn good pizza. I don't know like like what, I need to, I need to learn the origin story, but they are housed out of all of these like small, independent, little, mm, kind of rural, convenience stores okay and and obviously their model must be take their physical space 
and give them all of our ingredients and stuff, right? And allow them to be able to sell our Hunt Brothers pizza in their physical space. And I remember being like, oh, I've seen Hunt Brothers pizza like all over. And then I Googled it and dude, they've got thousands of locations. So they literally just kind of piggybacked over other people's spaces so they don't have to worry about that so I, I i thought it was fascinating and so like when you said that that's kind of what comes to mind right i love that i'm going to be researching yeah. that all afternoon rob yeah i'm gonna to have to research that too so <laughs> figure out the origin story well johnny thank you so much for joining us on the income flip um i think today's session is you know how are we we actually flipping flipping our thinking right not just our money but our thinking about what we're actually building. I don't think people take the time enough to sit back and say, you know, what am I actually building? And can I build the life in the way that I want to live it based on what I value, what's important to me? Um, you know, sometimes I heard you use the word competition. I'm very, I was very competitive multiple times because I think what you probably learned is that, you know, and I am, super competitive and still am and I have to realize that that is a that is both a force that that propels me but it's also a thing that holds me back right and um and so I heard you use that word a couple of times and I acknowledge that you're probably saying that that was a prison that you were keeping yourself in is that right absolutely yeah yeah it it, it fed the fire right I would look to burn things and at, at a certain point you got to step back and get a little Simon sinek -y and be like, why? <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, it's like, hey, what, what is this, right? What is this? So I would encourage people to go explore that idea a little bit. It's pretty profound. Okay, guys, we'll make it a great day. Jody, thank you so much for joining us on The Income Flip. Thank you, Rob. I really appreciate it. Sure thing.